morning. I'm upstairs in my room because mom's sleeping and I need to be quiet. But I figure I can give you a tour of where everything is, where my entire life is now kept in boxes. That is a box of clothes. And if you'll notice, all sorts of dishes. See, that's a, that's a glass. That's a mug. Oh, it's a little dark in there. That's a plate. And, ooh, that's another box. That is a box of books. That's actually three stacks of books that I want to box up and bring with me to Buffalo. You'll notice that I have every single Harry Potter book over there except for the Sorcerer's Stone. I'm thinking that I lent it out to somebody and then never got it back. In fact, I'm pretty sure. But it's kind of a shame. Back over there. Oh yeah, there are more books in the um, green and black bag. Then there are the tarot cards and Doctor Who. He wasn't allowed to get packed up. There was just no way that was happening. And then those are two stacks of other things. That is every single sort of bedding that I own. You'll remember that comforter well. That's the dog bed on top of two boxes of winter clothes. That's Willow. That's the plant minus Yorick, because cats jump up there and I don't want Yorick getting broken again. And the little styrofoam cup of carrots. You can see the little carrot bits sprouting out. I can't wait. They're going to be yummy. I'm really just having fun playing with the Zoom today. It's the first time I've ever really played with it. And that pink blanket is covering the ton of kitchen appliances that, oop, that's my finger, that mom has been <laughs> insisting on collecting at garage sales. You'll see a crock pot, there's a blender and a food processor, not sure why I need both. There are pans, colanders, that is a really nice pot, we have to sneeze. And there are just things all around. And like I said, since the cats jump around here, <laughs> trying to keep it covered up. And that is called My Life in Boxes. Dad and I just dropped off the boys' car because they both got called into work. They're, they're subbing, substituting at the high school and middle school and wherever, I think. And they'd, ha they'd made a, um, an appointment to get their car inspected because it's getting to the end of the month and they haven't done it yet. But then they ended up getting called in, so Dad and I dropped it off. At 12.30 I go into work, and I'll be there until 6. I was going to mow the lawn today. But it rained earlier, and it looks like it's going to, according to the Weather Channel, rain on and off all day. There's a lot of green on the radar. And tomorrow's going to be rainy, and the weekend's going to be rainy. So Thursday and Friday are, looks like, the only days that I'm going to be mowing the lawn. Not that you need to be knowing this. This is just me babbling. At any rate, my history for you today covers the history of smiling in a photograph. I see at first, um, when you know, they were painting portraits and everything, the peasants and the drunks were really the only people to be displayed smiling. I mean, the people with money were seen as sophisticated, and so they just had this solemn look on their faces. Some places allegedly told the people to say prunes because that, you know, puckers your mouth. And so they look more solemn. Now the 20th century comes along, and dental hygiene actually kicks up, and they realize, oh, well, maybe we do want these teeth. And so they start taking care of their teeth, and they start, you know, not being ashamed of them, just showing them off. So that and say cheese come about. I'm not sure if it's really a it worked like that, but you know, it's you can't deny that cheese makes you smile. The big contributor is also Kodak. You know, they had advertisements for their snapshot cameras, and those advertisements would highlight just how fun, quick, easy it was to and go rather than sitting for like a week on a bench being painted. And so, you know, if you're going to advertise fun, then people chances are are going to smile. And that is the history of smiling for a camera. I also read this book. This was yesterday's book that I breezed through. 
The Disreputable History of Frankie Landau Banks by E. Lockhart? Yes. I liked it, so I ordered a bunch more. Now, you know, it had some thought behind it. It talked a little bit about Michel Foucault and this Panoricum, I think it was? Pandoricum? Something like that? No. Actually. That just rem wow. I just made a connection to, whoa, that's why they named this other book that. Because it totally makes sense now. Because this Pandoricum is the paranoid feeling that we have no matter where we are. Like, we could be in the deep woods and we're thinking, somebody's following me. Because we're just so used to that. Because everywhere we've got surveillance cameras, we've got clerks keeping an eye on you. Just, you are always being watched. And so even in places where you aren't being watched, which does counteract that always that I tacked in there, even in the places where you aren't being watched, you just feel like you are. You just get paranoid. And that is the Panoricum. Pandoricum. Ah, what is that name? Spent a good ten minutes looking in the book for the word. Didn't find it. Found all the wrong pages. And then the battery ran out. So, now I'm done. Cheers.